All right, let's get started with the very first part of Chapter 13's video lecture. Now we're finally talking about the Mongols. All right, uh, so Chapter 13 is the second to last of our um, chapters for Unit 3, the post-classical era. We have one last chapter, Chapter 14, and that's going to uh, be about the Americas, primarily looking at the Aztecs and the Incas. All right, but today we're going to look at Eurasia, right? Uh, so when we talk about, of course, Eurasia, we're talking about the two continents of Asia and Europe, uh, which is really just one continent. Now, uh, Eurasia is what we're going to see during this time period with the Mongols is that there's going to be greater integration, right? That means interlocking spheres of cultures and states and societies and people and economies uh, you know, from East Asia all the way to Europe, to Europe uh, from South Asia to, to Russia, and from the Middle East, you know, uh, to East Asia. And um, the primary force behind this integration is going to be the, the rise of the Mongols and the creation of the world's largest empire, which is going to be the Mongol Empire. But it all starts in the Central Asian steppe, right? Remember, the Central Asian steppe is this kind of like semi-dry grassland that runs across uh, Central Asia. Uh, so it starts around here, right, which is where modern day Mongolia would be. And it r runs all the way up to around here, uh, which is, um, you know, modern day like Kazakhstan and Ukraine and uh, even Russia. So the Central Asian steppe is this huge, huge area right, of, of Central Asia, uh, dry grassland. And of course, the this place is going to be inhabited by nomadic people, right, uh, because it is simply too dry. Uh, for agriculture to take root. Um, so these people are going to be nomads, they're going to be pastoralists, they're going to be raising animals. And uh, the main animal is going to be the horse, right? But they're also going to have goats and sheep uh, and even camels eventually. Now, the interaction of the nomadic people and these, you know, settled agrarian or agricultural societies uh, has been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, going back uh, to the beginning of the Neolithic Revolution, right, in time period one. Um, so we see that the, uh, the pastoral people, many times they have served as merchants, right, because they uh, are guiding or they, or they serve as guides because they guide merchants uh, across the Central Asian steppe, right? Uh, along the Silk Road. Sometimes they're guards, right, because they're hired to protect the merchant caravans. And sometimes, of course, they're also mercenaries, right, where they go in a, and attack the merchants. Now, these are the yurts. This is the, you know, the, uh, it's kind of like a portable tent, uh, similar to kind of like the Native American teepee, right, made out of animal skin. And um, so the geography, of course, is a big uh, determinant of the lifestyle of these people. Now, the nomadic people are going to have different traditions that we've seen in other, again, like, you know, what they would call themselves more civilized places. Uh, the nomadic traditions, um, one of the, probably the most striking one is the fact that there is less patriarchy uh, in nomadic societies, right? Uh, whether we're looking at the Mongols or their ancestors, people like the Huns or the Zhang Yu uh, or their relatives, which are like the Turks. Right? These are all different nomadic people across Central Asia. Uh, but for the most part, they're going to be less patriarchal. Uh, and that is simply because women are going to have many roles besides, you know, child care and housekeeping. They're going to take care of animals. They're going to hunt. So they're going to herd. Uh, they're, and many times they're even going to go fight. Uh, so because women have multiple roles outside the home, they're going to have not necessarily equal status, but almost equal. And uh, we see that uh, there's going to be a lot of social mobility, right? So they, they don't have concepts of like nobility and commoners, like we would see like in feudal Europe, medieval Europe. Uh, basically, you know, you have a social ranking, you know, based on wealth, right? The more animals you have, obviously the wealthier you are, right? The larger herd you have. Uh, but that is fluid, right? Because from one day to the next, if you're attacked and they steal your animals uh, or they kill off your herd, uh, you become poor. Right? So it is very fluid. So people can move up, people can move, drop, move down, uh, and there's going to be a lot of conflict within the, within the different tribes of the nomadic people. Uh, when it comes to religion and their culture, 
nomadic people are going to notice that they're not going to have um, a written language for most of world history. Uh, it isn't until pretty much the Mongols start setting up that we see the, the first kind of like written languages. They're going to have oral traditions similar to like what we would have seen in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they're going to practice uh, shamanism, which is really like another word for animism. You know, the belief in spirits and nature, the belief that there's numerous gods, the belief that there's certain people like shamans, uh, or in South Saharan Africa, they would be called the Viners, who have that special connection to the gods. Um, and the gods are like in, you know, nature gods, like, you know, the sun and the sky and, the, you know, the rivers and the land, stuff like that. Uh, so they're going to be polytheistic um, uh, religion. Now, within all these tribes and all these different groups, and, you know, they're constantly fighting each other, constantly at war with each other, uh, we're going to see the birth and the rise of the guy who's going to kind of like change everything. Uh, and he is known as Genghis Khan, or sometimes it's pronounced or spelled Chinggis Khan. Uh, but originally he was known as Temujin. Uh, so that's this his birth name. Uh, so what he starts doing, he starts uniting the different Mongol clans. Uh, and one of the things he does is um, he'll start marrying his you know children to like other tribes you know, to get kind of like a loyalty, a mutual loyalty thing going on. Uh, anyone who opposed them, he would like kill them and kill the family so that there's no like opposition left. Uh, so he, he was pretty violent, pretty ruthless, but extremely smart and understanding like what drove the Mongols and other nomadic people to fight. Uh, and eventually he's able to unite all the Mongols uh, and they would elect him as Genghis Khan, right? So in, within the Mongols, we're going to see the term Khan, which means chief. Uh, and Genghis Khan is, of course, the chief of everyone, the chief of the world. Uh, so one of the things he would do uh, is uh, he, he would develop a meritocracy. So it wasn't based on, like, family ties or clan loyalty or, um, or like, birth status, right? Your, your position in this Mongol society was based on your abilities, right? Based on fights, on, on, on war, right? So if you are able to perform in battle and be successful, then you get rewarded, right? And that's like a, like a motivation for the Mongols to keep fighting and, and, you know, try to outdo the people around you to make yourself stand out because, you know, there's going to be a, um, a reward system, right? Rewards in, in play. Uh, so the Mongols are going to, uh, Genghis Khan is going to use meritocracy to develop loyalty, right? Because any Mongol is now able to rise up in society and move up and become, uh, you know, wealthy and become upper class, right? Regardless of what their background is, regardless of who their family is, anyone can move up. So it is very egalitarian in that sense that everyone has more or less an equal shot. Now, um, the Mongols are going to uh, unite, and this is going to be um, the first kind of big difference in the relationship between nomadic and settled uh, societies. Because for the most part, when the nomads attack the settled places, like you know China, they would build the Great Wall and try to keep uh, the you know the Huns or the um, or the Zhangnu or the later on the Mongols, right? Those were like tribes that would attack and run. You know, they'll come in to raid and, and steal stuff. But they wouldn't go in to conquer. They wouldn't go in to settle in. Um, because the, the nomadic people were still at war with each other, right? They're constantly rivaling, fighting against each other. But once all of them are united and they all have the same common purpose, which is to conquer everything, that's exactly what they're going to do, right? They're going to conquer everything, everywhere. And they're going to create the world's largest land empire. And I say land because... The world's largest empire was actually a what we call a maritime empire, which is the British Empire. But that's probably in the 1800s, right? More you know closer to our modern times. But in the 1300s and the 1200s, right? That's when the Mongols were up and running, and they create the largest empire in world history, right? And they have become known as the Khanates, right? The empire ruled by the Khan, just like we saw the Shogunate in Japan and the Sultanate in India, and the Caliphate, right, in the Abbasid Caliphate, right, uh, with the Caliphs. Now we see the Khanates, and they're going to conquer China, 
right? They're going to conquer, which is, you know, the wealthiest country on earth. They're going to conquer most of the Middle East, ruled by the Abbasids, right? Or used to be ruled by Abbasids. And they're going to conquer Russia as well, right? And they're going to build a brand new capital, uh, which is uh, basically in the middle of what is now called Mongolia. Um, and they're going to conquer everything, right? And here's some of his more famous... Um, sayings that are supposedly uh, supposedly attributed to him, whether they are or not, who really knows. Uh, so let's talk about the Mongols and why they were so successful. Why were they able to you know, go around and conquer everything and everyone? Uh, for the one thing, every single soldier the Mongols had was on horseback. So that means they're a part of the cavalry. They're not infantry. That means walking you know, foot soldiers. They're cavalry. And it means that you know on horses, and these people are trained from like birth, to ride and fight and live on a horse. So that means within a day they can move a hundred miles. So imagine your entire army marching a hundred miles, right? In one day, riding a hundred miles. Any other army at that time, you know, at best they'll do like 20 miles, 25 miles, like the Romans would probably have like around 25 miles. But the Mongols can do it four times as fast because they're all on horseback, because they're all nomadic people. Uh, they're also self-reliant. They don't need to trade. They produce their own goods, right? Because remember, they're they're nomadic people, so they, they really can't rely on trade to meet their needs. They have to depend on themselves. So you have an army that can move super fast. You have an army that is super organized, right, with a chain of command. You know, you have a commander for 10 people. You have a commander for 100 people. You have a commander for 1,000 people, right, like a general and stuff like that. So it's super organized. Uh, it, it doesn't have to depend on the on anyone else. They you know, rely on themselves. Uh, they they develop uh, like road networks, uh, postal services. You know, kind of like in American history, you've probably heard of the Pony Express. Well, the Mongols did it first, right across their entire empire, allowing them to communicate fast, right? Um, you know, with each kind of like station having having like horses so that the messenger can take the horse and ride super fast. Uh, and on top of that, of course, you have a highly motivated army looking for opportunities to improve their wealth and their status. So you combine all these things, right? Uh, it, it's a force. It's a strong, powerful force that, you know, that is worth, you know, uh, fearing. Now, another thing about the Mongols is that as great as they were and as successful as they are, they realized as they came into conflict with the people of China or the people of the Middle East, or the people of Russia, is that they don't know everything. And that there's other things out there that are new and different and strange to them, but that they can use. So the most famous examples is that when they went to China, right, China has built these huge walls and stuff like that, right? So they start learning how to build siege engines. They would kidnap Chinese engineers and build like towers and build catapults and trebuchets they will build, uh, use the like, gunpowder to like, you know, as explosives, right? Which is a Chinese invention. So they'll use the inventions of the technology of the people that they were attacking to attack them. And wherever they went, they would spread this use in technology, right? So the Mongols are credited for helping popularize the use of gunpowder. It was a Chinese invention. The Mongols spread it to the rest of the world. Uh, so again, everyone again is a horse on horse, right? They're a member of the cavalry. They all have you know bows and arrows. They all can shoot from you know super accurately from far away. They can run up to an army, shoot, and then run away before the army has even you know, a chance to you know fight back. Uh, and you see all these soldiers. It's you know must have been a, a scary sight to see, right? And uh, you know they had steel just like any other soldiers. Each soldier would have, you know, armors and weapons, and their horses would have been protected as well. They would use siege weapons, you know. Um, now, probably the most important tactic is the use of terror, right? And in the earlier stages, especially, the Mongols would completely destroy and kill everyone who resisted them. And this kind of level of destruction, we've seen it before, you know, the Assyrians back in ancient Mesopotamia, the Romans as well. They did equal level of violence and destruction. Um, but the Mongols did it fre more frequently. And eventually it led to a, a reputation amongst other enemies. 
that if you resist, if you fight, if you put up, you know, stand up against the Mongols, it's going to be the end of you. Uh, and we see that when they go into China or into Russia or into the Middle East, they will completely destroy major cities because of the resistance that they would have put up. So using terror as a weapon uh, is you know, part of the, the key to understanding the success of the Mongols. So the Mongols built this huge, huge, huge empire, right? What is we call a trans-regional empire, right? Because it goes to, across multiple regions. You know, it goes from China to the Middle East, uh, sorry, Central Asia to the Middle East to Europe, right? An extremely huge empire. Um, but once they control everything, they bring peace to Eurasia. They bring stability. And this is a time period known as Pax Mongolica, right across the 1200s, a hundred years of peace, more or less, under the rule of the Mongols. Uh, and during this time, they build their capital called Karakorum, uh, which is now again in Mongolia. Um, we see interactions between these different worlds, the Chinese and Muslim world. And they start interacting with each other under the leadership of Genghis Khan. Right, so they will bring in scholars and educators and religious officials from all over all throughout Eurasia and get them together and each one will teach different things to the Mongols. The Mongols will pick which parts they like, which parts they don't like. They were very open minded, very very religiously tolerant. Right? They didn't even charge taxes. Right? They didn't even charge taxes on religion. So imagine that. That was something new. Right? That's the level of tolerance we've never seen in world history. So they built the, the Silk Road again. They, they destroyed the previous one. They destroyed, you know, the ones that were set up by the Tang and the San Dynasty of China and by the Abbasid Caliphate in the Middle East. Right? They destroyed that one. But once they reinstated it, once they bring it back, brought it back up, it grows more than ever before. Right? It, it uh, expanded more than ever before. Because it's quite simply, you know, there's only one price to pay. Remember before, you know, if you traveled like from Han, China to Rome, to the Mediterranean, you had to pay all these different you know, cities, all these different states, all these different kingdoms along the way, right? Each merchant had to pay a tax, which of course increased the cost of the goods. But when you only had to pay once, because there's only one empire left standing, that's the Mongols, right? It reduces the cost of trade and therefore trade will increase and more and more people are going to trade than ever before. Not only merchants going to travel, we're going to see diplomats and missionaries, ambassadors, right? There's stories of like French and German and Italian um, travelers, you know, going from, from Europe all the way to, to Central Asia, all the way to East Asia, all the way to China, right? Because they're safely walking across the Silk Road because the Mongols provided absolute security. And no one, of course, would, you know, try to challenge the Mongols. So less taxes, more safety, more trade, right? That's kind of like your mathematical equation. Um, and we see populations are going to um, not necessarily migrate, but they're going to be shifted. So we're going to see a lot of Persians and Middle Easterners going to China. We're going to see a lot of Chinese uh, going into Central Asia. We're going to see a lot of Central Asians, of course, going to like places like Russia. So we're going to see a more integration, mixing of populations and cultures than ever before. Uh, one kind of like negative side effect is the spread of the bubonic, bubonic plague. Right? It starts in China right? and it makes its way across the Silk Road. Thank you Mongols for that one. And eventually we know how destructive it is in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, right? in the Mediterranean area. Um, so the Mongols during Pax Mongolica, they're going to diffuse a lot of technology and culture. So, for example, the use of cannons, right, which is an advanced level of gunpowder technology, that's going to be a thing. The use of paper currency, which is a Chinese invention, we're going to start seeing it in the Mediterranean world, in the Muslim world, in the European world, right? We're going to see the increased popularity of Buddhism and Islam, right? Now that they're completely tolerant and now that there's no restrictions and the states, the governments don't restrict the spread of religion, all right, we see those two religions become more and more popular. We see religious tolerance for the first time, really. 
We see respect for merchants. The Mongols loved merchants. Merchants made them money. So respect for merchants across the board, especially in China, is going to increase thanks to the Mongols. Even pants. The use of pants. Mongols were one of you know nomadic people in Central Asia. They were one of the first people to wear pants. Almost everyone else wore like long you know tunics or long uh, you know gowns, I guess you could call them. Well, actually wearing pants and a shirt. That was a Mongol thing. Uh, and it is, of course, during this time where we see the famous traveler Marco Polo, right, who travels on the Silk Road. All right, so we're going to stop here for our very first video lecture. Hopefully you're not staying up way too late to do this. But if you are, you know, shame on you. Because you had a couple of days to do this. If you're waiting until the last minute, that's kind of like on you, I guess. All right, so that's it for now. Thanks for watching. See you next time.